Hello everyone, this is Amir from Audio Science Review. Today we're going back to school again, but don't worry, it won't be a super dense topic. Uh, but it's a useful one and a question that comes up all the time, which is, why don't you test with square wave? And uh, people tend to think that that square wave is a magical signal in that it brings out measurements that you wouldn't see with a typical sine wave. So. I thought I'd talk about why I don't do it by uh, doing some demonstrations for you so that you get a good practical feeling for what the issues with uh, square wave testing is. Uh, I've got my audio precision analyzer again running. This is the user interface for it. Um, I've set it to 10 kilohertz and the signal up here, if you can read it, says square. So it's been told to generate the square wave. Uh, look to the right. Does this look like a square wave to you? It doesn't, right? It looks like a pretty sine wave. How is that possible? How could it be a sine wave when I'm asking it to generate a square wave? Well, if you uh, could keep up with my last uh, long and complicated video on, on Fourier transform, you would know why. Because I explained to you that uh, square wave, when you decompose it, it becomes an infinite range of uh, sine waves that you have to add together to make a square wave. Otherwise, you don't have a square wave. So uh, if you look on the left, you see why this is not the case here, that our bandwidth for capturing that signal is only 22 kilohertz. So the generator in the analyzer is generating a square wave, and I'll show you in a second. But because on the receiving side, we're truncating everything after 22 kilohertz, we cannot capture the third harmonic of 10 kilohertz. So the tone, I carefully set it to be 10 kilohertz. So the first harmo uh, uh, odd harmonic that you need to make a uh, square wave would be 30 kilohertz. But since we truncate everything at 22 kilohertz, we basically just have the primary tone, which uh, is a sine wave. So the Fourier transform works. So notice what happens now if I set this to bandwidth to 500 kilohertz. All of a sudden, we get a full square wave. Why? Because we're capturing many, many, many odd harmonics of 10 kilohertz, and that starts to look almost like a square wave. Now, if you don't believe me, let's uh, look at the uh, uh, what a Fourier transform of a square wave is. And this is a Wikipedia page on... Uh, uh, square wave that you can peruse at your uh, leisure. Uh, it is written by math people, so you're going to get totally lost. But one key thing for it is that if you look in here, this is what it winds up being, the expansion of this uh, series. And it says basically you take a bunch of sine waves and this basically translates into odd sine waves. Um, and you add them up together and you get a square wave. But look at what you have to add from k equals 1 to what? Infinity. So this is why I say you need to have infinite amount of energy to make a square wave. If you don't have infinite amount of energy, then you don't have a square wave. Now, in our audio systems, we care about what we can hear. What can you hear? Can you hear above 20 kilohertz? You cannot. If you're young, maybe you hear a little bit more than that. But that's it. So very quickly, we truncate the bandwidth of any signal that we throw at the system. So the notion of a square wave just doesn't apply, certainly not to digital audio. If you have CD, by definition, you only have 22 kilohertz of bandwidth. So if you truncate that, you only get somewhat of a square wave at lower frequencies, and I can show you that. But uh, at higher frequencies, you basically do not. So. If I go back to my 22.4 uh, kilohertz and I make this, uh, let's say, 100 hertz, now we start to get a square wave. But notice that it's not a great square wave because we don't have all the frequencies. This slanting that you see in here happens because we're basically limiting the bandwidth, as I mentioned, to 22 kilohertz. So your CD format, which is the most common digital format that we stream, can't do square wave. And nothing in life can really do square wave because this transition from zero to max needs to be needs to have a zero slope. And when you don't have zero slope, you get artifacts in there. So people get a generator, an analog generator. Sometimes you get an RF generator, and I have signal generators that go to hundreds of megahertz. 
And you can get a beautiful square wave out of those because it goes to hundreds of megahertz. And then they stick that into an amplifier and then they look at the output. They say, whoa, you know, it did this or did that. But that's not a proper test because your amplifier is not designed to play back hundreds of megahertz. Your speakers certainly don't play hundreds of megahertz or hundreds of kilohertz even. And so it becomes a test of really a bandwidth test. There are amplifiers that have one megahertz bandwidth and they brag about how they have one megahertz or two megahertz bandwidth. But that's not bandwidth we can use. And by the way, wide bandwidth devices are, can be subject to oscillation. And uh, the device could be oscillating at 100 kilohertz and you may not even know it. It uses up power, may destroy itself. In rare cases, it may cook your Twitter. So as much as we like to feel good about, you know, using square wave to test something, I don't use it. It's not a common test. Uh, we used it in the old days, I should say, you know, in 70s and 80s. Because all you need is a generator, a generator square wave, and then you can look at this on an oscilloscope and immediately see some effects like the, uh, you know, band limiting or there was oscillations and so forth. You could see it around the edges. And uh, that was a convenient way to turn an oscilloscope into an audio an analyzer. Today, I have a perfect audio analyzer. Why try to interpret a square wave when I can literally look at the frequency response and I can look at distortion, I can look at noise. There's just really no reason to resort to a square wave. Um, I shouldn't say no reason. If you have a specific thing you're investigating, like you're designing an amplifier and what have you, a square wave may tell you something. But for the purpose of analyzing an audio device, it's just, uh, you know, what is the point of having all these tones running like this? It doesn't look like music. No music looks like this. Uh, nothing again can generate this uh, at all. I mean, we just don't have anything that has infinite bandwidth. As soon as you use a microphone to record a square wave, you get the same thing. You get a whole bunch of it truncated because the frequency response of a microphone is going to be like this and it's going to chop off a lot of these things. So really don't keep asking me for square wave tests it is not a proper test if i used it uh there'll be tons of manufacturers complaining saying hey why are you throwing these high bandwidth signals at audio devices it's not a valid test and they would have a good point in there uh, occasionally i will use a square wave uh let's say you want to look at how a digital filter is in a DAC and I'll show you whether there's ringing before and after, but also know that that ringing often happens, the frequency of those ringing is well above audio bands. So a lot of people get concerned that, oh, there's ringing, there's pre-ringing, post-ringing. It's like, no, if the ringing is not audible, then it's not audible. So, and by the way, when you band limit a system, like a you know, digital format is, you're gonna get ringing. There's just no, you know, if some butts about it. So if I go back to my, uh, you know, let's say go one kilohertz, you're going to get ringing, and that's the math says you will. But this frequency of these things is very high. Look at how closely they are spaced. So, you, you know, you're not, it's not going to be that, that audible to you. Okay, uh, this concept of square wave and what it is is super important signal processing. It will come up often. You may, it'll actually show up in jitter measurements, and, uh, and I'll show you some of that in the future. So, Please internalize this simple concept that the square wave has infinite energy, has infinite odd harmonics. So whatever frequency you say one kilohertz is gonna have another pulse at three kilohertz, another pulse at five kilohertz, and it goes on forever. And that the shape sort of is drops by a factor of one over whatever the harmonic order is. So you can see it dropping off. So Oftentimes, um, the digital circuits, when they're communicating a microprocessor in a device and it's doing things, it always has digital pulses and therefore has a lot of square waves. And if these square waves bleed into the analog section, they don't just generate one frequency. How many frequencies do they generate? A whole bunch of harmonics. And oftentimes I can spot this in a spectrum display and I'll just tell you, hey, that looks like a square wave uh, in there because I can see that it's goes in this odd harmonic cadence and that is bleeding from a digital portion to an analog. So if you have a USB DAC or you have a streamer, I can, by just looking at spectrum analysis, I can tell that a square wave has come in there. And what's the source of a square wave? Usually the digital circuits inside the DAC or device that we're looking at, uh, AV receiver and what have you. So 
Uh, it's super important to understand this little tidbit of signal processing. Many people don't understand this and uh, it has many, many practical consequences. We don't use it as a test signal, but we will experience it a lot as we have these mixed signal devices that have both digital and analog thrown together. Okay, uh, I'm gonna stop the video at this point. Hopefully you learned something. I know these things can be a little boring, but uh, it's important concepts. Otherwise you just won't be able to follow some of the explanations I give for measurements and why there are artifacts and what have you. Okay, see you in a future review. Bye-bye.